Thank you, Jeff, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenters. Paul Rukop is an attorney at Collins Collins LLP, Orange County office. His practice focuses on construction and professional liability litigation. And he represented a range of clients, including architects, engineers, general contractors, and public entities. He's also a very active member on the Committee on the Environment at AI Orange County. Adam Reeder is a principal with CDM Smith, a licensed professional engineer, and a certified flood pain manager. He has over 26 years of experience in structural engineering and is a nationally recognized subject matter expert from FEMA's building science branch in wind and flood mitigation. He has authored over 15 primary articles for FEMA and develops and teaches FEMA courses and designing buildings for future flood conditions, as well as courses on wind and flood mitigation. We are excited to hear from you both. Over to you, Paul and Adam. Thank you, Siama. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, is this up on everyone's screen? Yes, okay, great. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining today's presentation. Um, as Suyama mentioned, I'm an attorney with Collins and Collins. I presented for the AIA in the past. And if you went to that presentation, a lot of the content in today's presentation may sound familiar. Um, today's presentation is yes, your insurance company cares about climate change. Um, it may seem, you know, you've got these huge companies, um, they, they may or may not care. Certainly insurance companies in this instance do care. Um, they do care a lot about climate change. And well, let me get to this next slide here. I want to show you guys a quote that has gone around and went around for several years. Um, I think this was in 2017 that the CEO of AXA said a four degree change or four degree um, plus uh, world is not insurable. And this really is why uh, insurance companies are paying attention to um, climate change because uh, it's affecting their risk. And of course, insurance companies, they're in the uh, business of dealing with risk. Um, so insurance companies are looking at climate change and how it's going to be really affecting their bottom line. And of course, uh, as design professionals, um, you all have, have insurance. So it's something that uh, if, they're, if the insurance company is paying attention to it, um, it's going to be something that's going to be affecting you as well. So we went over what the learning objectives um, were at the outset. Jeff went over those. Um, just generally, I do want to give you an, an overview of how this presentation is going to go. I'm going to present some of the legal risks and how those translate into insurance risks. Um, and we've brought in Adam here today because he's a really is a subject matter expert on a particular aspect of climate change. And he's going to be able to give us some, I think, really concrete insights into how uh, code compliance just isn't enough in a world that, ha that is being affected by, by climate change. Um, so what are the legal risks? Um, they seem like they're pretty obvious. You know, if you um, haven't considered climate change, you may end up in some disputes with your clients, uh, there may be lawsuits, uh, Ultimately, that would translate into a judgment. You may even have some licensure problems. Those are the legal risks that um, architects and other design professionals um, are, are looking to avoid. So how does that translate into a, a risk from an insurance perspective? Well, something to keep in mind, of course, is that for your insurance carrier, your risk is their risk as well. So they're paying attention to how their insureds are mitigating against risk. Um, and of course, if 
their insureds are being sued because they haven't considered climate change in their design, there may be an increase in premiums. Uh, but also, it's not just limited to a, an architect. It's, it extends to an architect's client. Um, a client, of course, uh, may have insurance for their business. Obviously, we'll have some property insurance as well. Um, and if they are affected directly by climate change, let's say in the instance of a flood or um, sea level rise, then their carriers are going to be paying out as well. And that over time will translate into increased premiums for them. Uh, another issue to consider is that your clients may in fact be uninsured or un underinsured, I'm sorry, for uh, climate events. Um, if the design has only considered uh, the, the code minimum, the code may not be enough to cover the eventual or the actual loss as a result of a climate change event. And then the last issue is that your clients may simply end up being uninsured um, as a result of a climate event. Using the, the flood example, again, I keep returning to, to that because it's gonna be relevant to um, Adam's portion of the presentation, is that if there's a large scale event, um, there, there's going to be a lot of payouts and a lot of people are going to be affected all at the same time. The, payout, the payouts are all going to come due around the same time. Um, and what that may result in is simply an area not being able to, or clients in a specific area simply may not be able to obtain insurance down the line. In which case, how is your client mitigating from a climate change risk? Well, if the architect or a design professional has considered those risks, then they're already incorporated into the design and hopefully will mitigate future risk for the client. So when considering climate change and design, really have two categories um, of issues. And I'm speaking very broadly. Designing on how to cope with the effects of climate change. So designing for resilience, um, you know, how do you cope with changing weather, sea level rise, that sort of thing. Then the other aspect is how to design to mitigate climate change, also known as sustainability broadly. So how is the design not contributing to climate change? Um, and this goes over, this slide goes over uh, just generally that, that same definition but what I want to highlight here really is that the insurance companies are going to be focused on the resiliency aspect, right? Because the resiliency part is what ultimately affects them, at least more directly. Um, and if an insured uh, gets hit with a lawsuit because their client's um, building wasn't designed to withstand sea level rise, uh, then that's ultimately going to affect the insurance company. Um, sustainability is also a focus of the insurance companies, but I would say in a broader long-term sense. Um, insurance companies are looking at how are um, businesses who are affecting climate change really ultimately coming back and um, affecting the insurance company's risk. So in, in that respect, it's not something that's as a directly tied to um, insurance for, for, for design professionals, but insurance companies are paying attention to that. Certainly insurance companies have started to divest themselves from um, or divest uh, investments in unsustainable businesses, coal, um, that sort of thing. Uh, and the CEO here of, of AXA, we've quoted him a couple times in this presentation, uh, stated an unsustainable business is an uninvestable and uninsurable business. So they are paying attention to sustainability, but they're really more directly focused on, on resiliency. So 
underlying the the presentation so far really is you know why why is compliance with the code not enough you, one's got to think well we've got laws that we've got building codes that that cover these issues really the problem boils down to a standard of care issue um, the standard of care is broader than the codes it's changing all the time it's very fact specific and the codes really are historical they're looking backwards a lot of times there may be a weather event or um, an event that may force the codes to be updated or the legislative process updates the codes but it's a slow process and the standard of care does not change uh, with as slowly um, and it's also not as set in stone so an architect, so what I'm citing here is essentially a jury instruction regarding the, the standard of care that we use. And an architect's negligent if the architect fails to use the skill and care that a reasonably careful architect would have used in similar circumstances. Um, that's what we call the standard of care. So then the question is going to be, well, how do you figure out what the level of skill and care that a reasonably careful architect would use. It's gonna be based on expert testimony. And that's why we felt it was important to have somebody like Adam here, because it's folks like Adam who ultimately speak to this issue. Um, a very typical situation in a design prof professional lawsuit is looking at what other architects or other design professionals were doing in the area. What are the other considerations that um, that those architects are are keeping in mind? And also what's the information that's known to them at that time? So as climate change um, as the effects of climate change become more uh, prominent, frequent, that standard of care is also going to change because um, architects in an area that are affected by specific weather or specific climate change events um, are going to begin adapting design to, to meet those uh, or to withstand those, those uh, events. So the related concept is what's reasonably foreseeable? Um, you know, what would a reasonable person be able to predict and expect um, would result from their actions? So I've, I've indicated here earthquakes, right? Obviously not the result of climate change, but it's a concept that I think most of us are familiar with. If you're a structural engineer and you're not considering earthquakes in, San Francisco, then you're one, you're obviously probably gonna be following below the code, but let's say you meet the minimum code, um, you may still not be uh, meeting the standard of care because you haven't considered other factors that other structural engineers may be considering. So then we move on to something like wildfires. Well, you know, we've seen wildfires uh, in Southern California throughout California for the last couple of years now. Floods, I mean, you saw, was it Newport that, that, that flooded the, the other year um, near the coast? So as these events become more concrete and more frequent, it's gonna be less um, successful for a design professional to say, oh, well, we, could, we couldn't foresee the harm that would result from not designing with, uh, with those events in mind. So that's gonna, I, I wanna shift gears here and, and hand it over to, to Adam because Adam is going to give us, I think a really concrete example of where building codes just haven't caught up with the information that's known to design professionals, um, specifically with, uh, with, with flood protection. So I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Adam. 
Thanks, Paul. Um, so what I'm going to kind of walk through with you today is a little bit about where are the flood codes now? Uh, what are the flood codes missing? Try and make a little bit of a case for you about uh, why we need to look at higher standards, make some recommendations on that, and talk about the insurance implications. But ultimately, I think what we see is that a lot of times the, the flood um, protection is kicked to the engineer, except for the, the problem being that many architects have discussions with, with owners. And um, so these discussions with the client are excellent opportunities to talk about why are we going to go to a higher standard? Why are we going to go above what the codes are? And um, so, you know, this means either you guys can get more informed about this or you can bring your uh, engineer into this process a little bit sooner. But I wanted to give you sort of the, the background on the code. So what level of flood protection is required by the codes today? Since about 2006, um, the, the International Building Code uh, has referred to ASC 2405, so the American Society of Civil Engineers 2405. Um, that was sort of the second edition, but really the first one in the codes, and that's a, a design and construction for uh, flood uh, standard that, that's produced. Uh, so what it does is it breaks down buildings into flood design classes. This was a change that was made in ASC uh, 2414, um, but these are effectively those risk categories. So one being uh, agricultural, two being sort of most residential and non-residential buildings, three being higher occupancies, schools, that sort of thing, and, and four being critical facilities, hospitals, fire stations, police stations, that sort of thing. And what you can see by this is that, that in most flood zones that you guys are going to be dealing with, zone A, what it says is it's the base flood elevation plus one foot or uh, the local jurisdictions, flood protection measures, that's a design flood elevation, whichever is higher. You get into the flood design class four and it's it's plus two, the design flood elevation or the 500 year event, uh, whichever is higher. And we're gonna kind of talk a little bit more about what those mean, um, but uh, I I'm, I'm wanna kind of walk through in the next couple of slides uh, why we don't consider going high. But but I do want to point out this, that at the top of that, it says minimum flood proofing elevation or minimum flood protection elevation uh, that's in the code. So it says minimum, meaning that you can go higher if you elect to. It's just most design professionals don't. So let's go to the next slide. So why do so few consider designing beyond the minimum requirements? Well, a, a lot of people are scared that approximation, you know, incorporating sea level rise and that sort of thing, unless it's in, in sort of the local requirements can often be wrong. And they view it as a liability. They view it as they're gonna have, they better get to be good buddies with Paul because somebody's gonna take them to court over this. Um, the Gaining more certainty in flood elevations costs money. And a lot of times people feel like their clients don't often want to spend the money to gain more certainty in this. Um, a lot of designers, and, and I've presented a lot of, uh, you know, AIA conferences and that sort of thing. And I think there's, generally speaking, a lot understand that they should be considering it, but they don't know how. And a lot of times they start dealing with engineers that don't know how either. And, and so what I want to do is try to start educating you so that you can ask the right questions to any engineers you're dealing with and make sure that those people you're working with understand this and, and have a more um, uh, developed understanding of sort of these concepts. Um, designers don't feel like they have sufficient background to educate owners. They understand that this is happening. They understand that they need to be building higher, but how they convey that to the owners is often something um, that they're a little unsure of. We, we're going to talk a lot about the 100-year flood and the 500-year flood. And what does that really mean? And we'll deal with that in, in sort of the next slide. Um, the last one is people believe that the minimum elevation requirements include future conditions. Well, the first one that I want to point you to is uh, of these sub-bullets is the flood insurance rate maps do not consider it. So the flood maps everybody talks about are actually referred to as a firm or a flood insurance rate map. And the reason why they were developed was to um, provide insurance rating uh, projections so that they could sit there and rate these various buildings in these locations. 
The reason why they don't consider uh, future conditions is because they're insurance rating maps. You wouldn't want to pay insurance on an event that hasn't happened yet. So we don't want to put conditions 30 or 50 years in the future into a rating map uh, and have it not consider it. So we're still sort of figuring out what these new maps are going to look like, but I think everybody recognizes that that a map based on historical issues, which is what you want to pay insurance on, is not going to be the, the sole product that you need. So it's a starting point, but maybe not an ending point. Um, it, the building codes and standards only include a minimal elevation factor of safety. And for most buildings, that's one foot. In fact, if you read the commentary in ASCE 24, it actually goes through and it says that one foot of freeboard uh, accounts for the fact that you may have old maps. It accounts for a future development. It accounts for some climate change. Um, and, and there's a whole list of things of about seven things that it covers, but that's only one part. So if you only have one portion that's the climate change portion, then you are really underestimating it with that one foot. So let's go on to the next slide and kind of talk more about this. So um, the current codes and standards clearly aren't provi are providing insufficient protection based on the natural hazard losses that we're seeing. And, and flooding continues to be the number one natural hazard in the United States. $2.7 billion in annual losses for a 10-year average, and it's getting worse. And climate change is going to make this worse. So what do we do about this? And uh, the current you know, minimum requirement by the National Flood Insurance Program that communities have to meet is building to that base flood elevation, the 100-year event. And that is actually sort of, we use the 100-year event, but that doesn't mean that it's a one uh, every once in a hundred year event. Uh, so if you have one, it's not going to happen again for another 99 years sort of thing. What it means is that it's a 1% annual chance of being equaled or exceeded. So every year there's a 1% chance. And, and we oftentimes use say a 50 year design frame for in terms of a lifespan as kind of a minimum for wind design, for seismic design, so I just use that as an example, and there's about a 40% chance of that being equaled or exceeded. So that gives you an idea of sort of how risky that base foot elevation is. And oftentimes we're using freeboard or one foot above, above that in order to account for future conditions. And what I'm saying is the number one thing you can do is stop using that to account for future conditions. We need to try and change our, our mindset. So on the next slide, I'm going to kind of talk about why that doesn't meet the meet the mark in terms of providing you protection. So in a coastal area, we often have what are called depth limited waves. And I included this diagram, which looks very complicated, but I think I can quickly kind of walk you through this. Um, the red line on there is the 100 year still water elevation. So think of that as storm surge coming in from a hurricane or whatever your 1% annual chance is. Um, and that's the water with the waves cut off. So that's just regular uh, storm surge, but no waves on top of it. The light blue line with the highlighted BFB, that is what happens when you get waves on top of it. So the deeper the water is, the higher the waves are. And so the, the closer inland you get, the, the uh, less deep or shallower the water is, the lower the waves can actually be. Well, if we have sea level rise, so you'll see sort of on the right side at the bottom, you'll see increased still water elevation. That's kind of that dark blue dashed line. That's our, our sea level rise. Or you could say even that's a 500 year fl uh, flood, but it's a deeper flood. And what you can see is that these uh, dashed lines, sort of that second um, dark blue dashed line that's up on top, that would be the, the wave heights uh, for that increased still water depth. So you're gonna have higher and higher waves. And what this means is that the closer you get or the more at risk you get buildings, that that freeboard is providing less and less protection. So that's why even if you have a foot or two feet of freeboard, the closer that you're getting to the shoreline, the less protection is provided. So let's kind of look at this in a riverine location and I'll show you that you know even that may not provide what you're looking for. So next slide. So 
this uh, example on the, the right is uh, an example of two riverine floodplains. And one of them, think of about that really shallow floodplain, say somewhere in, I don't know, North Dakota or in, or in sort of a, an open plains area. And what you can see is the difference between the 100 year or the 1% annual chance and the 500 year or the 0.2% annual chance flood is about six inches. And that one foot of preboard provides you a good bit of protection. Maybe that's to the thousand year flood or something. If we get into a, a more narrow channel, say a, a canyon or something like that, and you're, and you're building a house, um, here we've got the 100 year flood elevation uh, or the 1%. And then we've got above that the 500 year or the 0.2% annual chance. And that distance is maybe three feet instead of the example above that's maybe six inches. That one foot of freeboard is providing you less protection. So maybe that's providing you protection in some instances to the 120 year flood instead of say the, the, um, the thousand year flood. So what I'm trying to explain is that, is that this level of protection is all over the board. And so if you just rely on the codes, you aren't getting this consistent level of protection. So if we were to say, just use the 500, we would get sort of a similar risk protection across communities, representing that these really high risk areas where there's a big difference between say the 10 year flood and the 100 year flood or the 10% chance and the 1% chance flood, that if you have big changes in those, you can get more protection. So let's go to the next slide and, and let me sort of add on to this case of sort of why, you know, what else we can achieve by going with, say, the 500 or something like that. A lot of people, a lot of these engineers you're going to be dealing with are, are not aware that the 100 year flood that's shown on the map represents only 50% of the 100 year floods that they have modeled. So what you're seeing on this uh, graph is that you're seeing sort of what we call the upper and lower bound of, and sort of that's the range of say 90 to 95 percent of the flood models that they get. In this instance, it's 95 percent. And so what they do is they, they put a line there that's sort of this best fit. And so this median value or say half of the floods in that model are going to be below that line, half of the floods model are going to be above that line. So when you build to the 100 year, you're only building to account for half of the 100 year floods that could be out there. And so if you use a higher uh, amount of freeboard in these instances, or say a higher return period, um, then you can really kind of uh, protect yourself against more of these floods. And really what we want to do with brand new construction is try and put ourselves closer to that top dotted line and say that that solid black line when we're kind of trying to figure out uh, how high we should build something. So again, these uh, flood insurance rate maps, these other uh, maps uh, and, and products like flood insurance studies are only representing 50% of these floods. So we need to try and think about how we can we get to a higher level of protection. So what's another way that we can, we can accomplish this? Let's go into the next slide. So if we have clients that have the ability to evaluate risk at the site, then one of the things that we could do is compare the different approaches that we're looking at. The current design approach is, I'm going to use the base flood elevation, the 100 year flood, and I'm going to add one foot, two foot of freeboard on that to, to determine what we'll call a flood protection level. How high am I going to protect it to? And this might be uh, it might be how high the lowest floor of the building is in some instances. Um, but if you're going to drive flood proof, if you're going to build the building on the ground and then protect it to this, this higher flood elevation, then you use uh, dry flood proofing or shields and waterproofing systems to protect the building. And so, you know, in this current approach, this is what's sort of the approach used by the codes using uh, and the standards using just this minimal freeboard approach. What I would recommend to you is consider a revised approach. Go in there. Um, work with your engineer to do some modeling, take into account the sea level rise and, and some of those things I talked to you about in terms of if you're looking at a coastal area, how much sea level rise is, is going to happen to that still water elevation, recalculate what those wave heights are, and then you might apply some level of freeboard on top of that to sit there and go, well, we don't know exactly what's going to happen with this model, so we're going to put a little bit of a factor of safety on that. And then your freeboard is an actual factor of safety 
and not trying to account for everything. You can try to account for more knowns in terms of a future flood protection level. The other thing you can do in these riverine areas, we're getting more and more approaches to looking at how increased precipitation may change our, our um, flood recurrence intervals so that we have a better idea about well, what does say in, in 50 years or uh, whatever the lifespan of that building is, what does that new increased 100 year flood elevation look like? And then we would use that information to sit there and go, well, we've got, we've got these things that we know, but we may not be 100% confident in the, the flood model that we predicted or, or precipitation model that we used. Let me just add a little bit on top to give me some protection. And then you're actually getting what the intent of freeboard uh, is. So let's go to the next slide. So let's talk about just quickly these considerations for incorporating climate change into design. We may need to look at uh, sort of the end of the building lifespan and those thresholds and see if it's, if it's practical. Is it practical to build that high? Or do we need to sit there and go, what probability of flooding event are we, are we actually comfortable with? So, so we may need to be talking about, you know, can we get high enough? If we can't get high enough, then what is a practical level of risk that, that I can accept? Um, again, I talked about these uh, seismic and wind designs. Those are using a probability event happening over 50 years. So maybe that's a good threshold for you in, in this instance. So um, the wind design, we use approximately a 7% a probability over 50 years, and that's building to a 700-year recurrence interval. So you can kind of back into what these numbers is and talk to your owners about, so is a 10% chance over 50 years something that you're more looking for? That's closer to a 500-year flood. Um, you know, how much uh, risk are you willing to accept? And then whatever that residual risk is, that's where the insurance component is. That's where we're using insurance to hedge our bets against sort of what we can and can't construct to. And I would also say incorporate adaptability, sort of construct buildings that can either be elevated higher or dry flood proof tire at a later date to, to hedge our bets. So maybe, maybe I have an owner that can only dry flood proof three feet, or maybe I have people that are only willing to accept dry flood proof in three feet. But if I've got some of that stuff where maybe the foundation for that dry flood proofing is able to protect against going another foot higher, I can kind of sit there and know that I've got another foot in my back pocket. Or if I'm designing a building, can I do that later on? Um, I will say that, that what we're seeing in some other countries in terms of flood insurance is that uh, we are having what we call insurance retreat. And, and basically that means that insurance providers that provide private flood insurance are saying at a certain point, this is no longer an insurable structure. And so what you could find is in the future in some private insurance possibilities or, or um, environments that that you could have a client that loses their, their flood insurance, their private flood insurance at a later rate or date. Um, right now, the National Flood Insurance Program has not said anything about this. So many of you that have buildings, uh, single family homes typically qualify for National Flood Insurance Program. There are limits to uh, commercial buildings and non-residential buildings in terms of how high those are and in terms of how much money is available um, sort of the rating structure and that sort of thing. And that's where clients often start to look in the private flood insurance market and why you need to consider this potential for um, uh, insurance retreat when you're starting to sit there and decide how high should we build. So we're going to talk next about some other benefits of, of sort of going higher. But I do want to walk through real quick this last slide kind of in this section on sort of communicating this with your client and documenting this. And, and you'll see why this is important later. So let's go to the next slide. So communicating those risk assumptions for these future conditions. Um, so we want to talk about how we selected that higher BFD. If you do these climate change assessments and you start to look at future conditions, how did you arrive at that future B, uh, base flood elevation? If you're looking at that alternative of using a higher return period, that, that 500 year or 700 year or 1000 year, how did you arrive at those numbers? What, what did you agree with the client on and, and looking at that client's risk tolerance? Um, other future condition variables, uh, the amount of sea level rise, erosion rates that you may have considered subsidence or, or sinking of the ground rates, um, anything that you assumed in terms of 
including these sort of factors of safety of freeboard to account for and, and offset. Um, siting variables, sort of, did we consider future wave action and that sort of thing um, in some of these areas? So what are you considering in those? Foundation considerations, maybe we went with piles or a more robust foundation um, versus sort of a, a slab on grade foundation or something else. Why did you make these determinations? And then mitigation strategies that you threw out there as possibilities to consider, even if your client doesn't take you up on those right now. So you client, your client may have just a certain amount of money that they can afford and, and sort of what can be afforded. So let's talk about the next one. We're almost done with these. So insurance considerations for clients. I, I will say in the flood realm, uh, building to the minimum above the minimum elevation always saves on premium. So building higher, almost every instance is going to save you money. Um, the National Flood Insurance Program now says building further away from the flood source. So if you have any siting issues you can consider, that that may help you. Um, Building higher is often a better return on investment than paying business interruption insurance. You, you are going to save on that flood insurance. And at the same time, since you've reduced that risk, you may also see that um, in terms of, of less you have to consider with that business interruption. Um, consider how clients are financing their property to evaluate insurance premiums as a cash flow problem. A lot of times, if everything is bundled in terms of all of their insurance in monthly payments and that sort of thing, Consider how that is done, and that may make the better uh, consideration of building higher. A little bit more uh, building higher spread over the entire loan period, and that instant uh, sort of return on investment that you get with your hazard insurance, like your flood insurance, um, it often makes that return on investment um, a pretty good uh, you know, benefit for them. Uh, encourage them to consider business interruption insurance and evaluate which events are included and excluded from the policy. This is really important to see whether flood or wildfire, any of these other risks are included in their business interruption, and they may need to look at other uh, insurance mechanisms to cover that if, if one of the policies they're looking doesn't cover it. The reason why all this is important is, according to a FEMA report, 40% of the businesses never reopen after a disaster. And that to do only 29% are still operating after two years. So we really do need to consider, uh, to consider this in terms of why do we need to build higher? So let's do this last one. I think Paul, you had a few words to start off with this one. Uh, yeah, so on, on the, for the insurance considerations, um, I did want to just actually go back uh, real quick on the, sure. the standard of care issue that ties into some of the considerations that you'd pointed out, Adam. You know, I think a concern that a lot of times architects have, and it's actually a concern that attorneys tell them to have is like, am I agreeing to a higher standard of care or above the standard of care? And really and what we're trying to, I think, identify here or point out is you're not agreeing to a higher standard of care. You're just making sure that you actually meet the standard of care, right? Um, or that that question isn't put into question down the line, right? Um, when the factors or the information that's known has, has shifted a little bit, um, which and we can talk about ways to, to mitigate that. Although you've, got, you've gone over some of those in the, the prior slide um, uh, in, in the next couple of slides. Um, actually, why don't you go ahead and, and jump in on this? Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll finish wrapping this up. So yeah. consider whether your errors and emissions policy will allow you to ignore uh, climate change. I, again, we've dealt a lot with AXA XL and they basically have said, generally speaking, they think this is climate change is part of the standard of care. It's known, it's something that, that we all know about that we know is happening. And so they, they consider it part of their standard of care. I will say when you do this, be specific about any guarantees. We're not telling you to just generically take on climate change as building is right. protected against climate change, but be specific about which flood elevations you selected, which wind speeds, which temperatures you're designing against. And that way, if any of these models change in the future, you're specific about what you took into account with this. So you don't want to sit there and generically say, we took into account the 100 year, but we took into account this specific flood elevation, this specific wind speed, and that's what I designed the building to uh, resist or meet. Uh, when you go beyond the codes, document your assumptions, discuss them with your client, document the dates and source information, sort of where did you get this stuff or models, 
uh, used to make decisions, which version of a model is it, which study and the date of the study and document all this stuff so that you are protecting yourself against, against what you've done. So I think all of this will also help you just formulate sort of your plan about uh, mitigating against these hazards as you kind of design your building. So I'll turn it back over to Paul. Yeah, and, and on that issue too, I do want to know, you know, we understand that um, not the architects aren't necessarily handling all of the every all of these details, right? But I think to, to Adam's point earlier, it's the idea is to make sure that you guys as architects are understanding um, that these these are issues that are out there. And just because it's a sub consultant that may be dealing with the issue directly, right, doesn't mean that it's not ultimately going to affect you, at least from, from a litigation standpoint. Um, it happens all the time where something goes wrong on a project and everybody gets sued, you know? So it's, uh, it may be because of your sub consultant, it may be because of, you know, something that, that the architect didn't consider. Um, but it's, there are issues that as a design professional or as an, as an architect, you need to be aware of even if it's not directly your scope. So this is going to echo a lot of what, what Adam had just gone through, but I think the key here really is it's clear, consistent communication with the client um, about expectations and what you're trying to achieve. Um, I think it's not always going to be the case that you have an owner who says, okay, yeah, it looks like this is going to be a risk in the future. Let's um, make sure that we're, we're, uh, we're designing with that risk in mind, right? They may, they may say, I don't care. I, I, I really don't care. Um, I have this budget. I've got this bottom line, um, build it according to code. If you have this clear, constant communication, and if you see at the bottom that, um, that last bullet point, you're documenting that with your client, it's gonna be very helpful down the line, um, especially if there's a lawsuit and there's some evidence that you have discussed climate change or the specific issue that ends up um, coming up, it's gonna go a long way if you have something indicating, hey, I discussed XYZ risk with client, client said, go with what the code says. And in fact, um, I had a, a similar situation with a client who was um, an architect on the coast uh, dealing with a, a foundation design. Again, you know, something that a sub consultant or another consultant was directly dealing with, but she had a communication with the client saying, hey, it seems like this is the more conservative approach with the foundation design, and but this is also an acceptable foundation design. What do you want to do? Client went with what was cheaper, and it ended up being a problem. But in the end, it helped that she had that communication and that she had documented um, the consideration by the client. Uh, and then, of course, the insurance carrier was happy um, when the case settled. So. Um, See, let's go through these. Uh, the initial stages of the project. So, you know, when you're building the relationships um, and understanding your client's expectations, that's really the time to have this more open-ended uh, discussion. It's a little bit harder to have that discussion when you're 90% through, through the work that you need to do, and then you're bringing it up for, for the first time. Um, I think this next issue is, is pretty key, um, and I think also addresses part of what Adam's presentation was on, which is you talk, talk to your consultants or the other consultants on the project um, and make sure that your client is getting the information that they need to actually understand the risk. If nobody tells them about the risk, you know, then they're, they're not gonna really evaluate it. Um, whether it's talking to the structural engineer, maybe even having to hire somebody else um, to really evaluate uh, the risk of a particular project in the area that it's in, um, it's, uh, it, it may pay, pay off in, in the long run. So uh, with regards to contracts, you know, um, 
you want to, again, document, doc, that's really, I could say it ad nauseum, really, is you want to document, document, document uh, your expectations. Um, with regards to specific results, you know, you're not, um, as an architect, you're not going to be able to guarantee that something's going to withstand, for instance, a flood event down the line. You may design with a particular flood event, a flood event um, in mind and try to mitigate against that risk, right? But you're not going to say something along the lines of your contract of, we're designing um, X building to withstand a hundred year flood event or you know, whatever the, that standard might be. Um, be upfront about what's excluded, you know, um, this goes to a point that Adam made earlier, you can't take on all of climate change, you know, um, and particularly if you've had a conversation with the client uh, about something that they're not considering, commit it to writing. Um, and then we've talked about recommendations from, from consultants uh, and experts. Um, actually, before we move on to this next slide, um, the points that I just went over really they're they're about mitigating your risk and then that is something that the insurance company is going to appreciate right because the insurance company is looking at how much of exposure do I have through this insured and obviously if you get hit with a lawsuit and two lawsuits three lawsuits whatever it might be then obviously it's going to affect premiums the insurance company is going to be happy when they see that you know, you've taken these climate change issues into consideration and the case settles in a couple of months. Um, again, your risk to some extent is gonna be their risk up, up to, to you know, the extent of their, their policy. This last slide, uh, just wanted to address the sustainability issue. You know, I already mentioned the, the quote from from the AXA CEO regarding unsustainable businesses. Um, but you know, overall what, what the insurance companies are looking at are why am I going to support a business that is increasing the risk that I'm taking on? That's really what the logic is. Um, so architects have a, a role there too. Um, you know, it's a little bit more attenuated, but Architects can be designing for sustainability because at the end of the day, it's mitigating against an issue that might end up being a risk for you, which is the, the effects of, of climate change. So I just want to make, make sure to point that out here at the end of the presentation. Um, and there are ethics that, that uh, encourage uh, design professionals to consider not only sustainability, but, but resilience and advise clients of that as well. Um, I've identified the, the specific um, code sections or the, the sections with regards to the, uh, the ethics and professional conduct. I will note though, um, just because I, I should, these are ethical standards. They aren't necessarily, they don't reflect the standard of care. So much like, you know, throughout this, presentation, we've been talking about how the, uh, the code was the building code or whatever um, standard um, in your local jurisdiction may not be enough. Um, in, in, this, in this specific scenario, the, the ethical codes are, you know, they're, they're pointing architects in the right direction, um, but they aren't necessarily going to be uh, actually held against an architect. So, We've got these in here. I think that the presentation is going to be available, so you guys can can run through these um, on your own. But that uh, that pretty much wraps it up for us. I think we've, yep, we're good on time, um, and we're happy to take on any uh, any questions that, that folks might have either now or or afterward. This is our contact information. Um, feel free to email me, or you know, go ahead and give me a call and and we can discuss some of the issues that we went over today. Um, so I'll, I'll open it up. Are there any, any questions in the chat or? We don't have any questions on the chat. Uh, Paul and Adam, thank you for doing uh, this presentation. Is there anyone who has a question or would you guys like to discuss? We have about five minutes um, left.
Um, would you like to cover anything that you feel like that you kind of, you know, want to go over or? No, so if, if there are no questions, I think the only, uh, if you're going to take away something <laughs> from this, uh, just in a few sentences, it really is just, it's have the conversation, have the conversation with, with your client and then and memorialize it. Um, again, you know, we, even if it's, you don't design the, the most resilient building in the world, um, that, that's not the standard that you're aiming for. Um, you just want to make sure that you've had the conversation, your client has considered it, uh, and that you're protecting yourself down the line. Um, and, you know, you never know that the client might also take your suggestion to, uh, um, to, to make sure to consider climate change um, in the project. Adam, did you want to add anything else? Well, I guess one of the things I was I was going to say, I mean, we spent a long time talking about the codes. We often hear people referring to the codes. Um, the time frame that we're looking at, I would say that the American Society of Civil Engineers is now really kind of trying to push forward with looking at climate change right now and how they're going to address it for various hazards. But once you consider how long it's going to take them to get into those standards and then those standards adopted by the codes, we're probably the 2032 codes or something in terms of, of when those um, climate change um, uh, incorporations would be in the building code. So, you know, this is something that, that we all as a design community are going to have to address for a while on our own. And... Um, figure out how we're going to deal with this because it's it's again going to be another 10 years before it gets into the codes and I don't I think we all accept that we can't just kick the can further and further down the road right. um, and and just go well I'll wait on this until um, until it's in, in the code so um, we're, we're sitting there trying to to learn this stuff FEMA um, who's my primary primary client is trying to figure out ways to address this uh, we're trying to come up with ways to develop more tools for design professionals to, to use. Um, but again, I think as, as Paul said several times, this is a conversation. It's a conversation with your owner. It's a conversation with um, any of the sub consultants that you have um, to, to try and come up with the best that you can do um, that's, that's ideally above and beyond the codes um, in order to uh, limit your client's long-term risk. And we know that risk is growing and, and we need, need to kind of try and figure out ways in order to offset that risk and, and try and account for the knowns, the things that we can kind of project and just put some factor of safety on that for, for the unknowns. Right. And document, document, document. Yeah. <laughs> Please. <laughs> so um, I just want to thank Paul and Adam for sharing your expertise and giving us that very important perspective. The AA Orange County Committee, uh, Committee on the Environment considers this a very critical message. And I wanna say a special thank you to Collins Collins LLP and CDM Smith for their support. And I also wanna thank all of you for taking the time to join us today. Please feel free to follow up with the AAOC code for future programming or questions, I've included my email on the chat. Have a wonderful rest of your day and thank you again. Thank you everyone, thank you for your time. Thank you.